Not sure if you're normally a three-point person, but if you want uh, three points from this morning's message, these are what uh, I hope we hear. They'll be fleshed out um, a lot more than just these bare bones as we go through them. But three things. Firstly, we need the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with and baptised by the Spirit. We are completely dependent upon him. Secondly, as Christian believers, we have been filled. We have been baptised with the Spirit. We are not lacking in any way, or perhaps better put, the Father has not withheld the Spirit in any way for those who believe in Christ. And thirdly, having received the Spirit, the same Spirit who remains on Jesus to this day, is the spirit who we have been given. We've been adopted into the family, Father, Son and Spirit and in receiving the Spirit we've received power from on high, power for a particular purpose, not some sort of magic or spiritual hullabaloo but it is power for a specific purpose, God's purposes, which we'll come to see later on. I wonder if any of us were asked before this morning What was the work of Christ? What did he come to do? What do we know of him? What was Jesus to do while here on earth? I wonder how long it would take us to exhaust all of our answers. He was born to be born in Bethlehem, a son in the line of David. He would gather his disciples. He'd perform miracles. He would preach and teach concerning the kingdom. He would be betrayed. He would be crucified at the hands of men. In doing so, he would take away our sins and yes, he would rise from the dead, ascend to the right hand of God and we'd fill all that out and more. But I wonder how quickly we would come, if at all, to the point that Jesus came to baptise us with the Holy Spirit. Is that in our thinking even, in regards to the work of Christ? It's an area we speak of little, yet it's of critical importance. All four Gospels record John the Baptist announcing that whilst he comes to baptise with water, he's not even worthy to untie the sandals of this one to come. All four Gospels say, this one to come will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. It's not too often that an event or a speech is contained in such detail in all four Gospels, so it's worth taking note when one does. The very reason John the Baptist came was that this one, Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Spirit baptizer, would be revealed to Israel. We make much of Christ crucified, and so we should. It's the core of the gospel, like the hub of a wheel. Without it, nothing else holds together. But I don't know if you've ever tried to ride a bike with a broken spoke. And I think this issue, the the whole matter of being baptised in the Spirit is like one of the very important spokes of that wheel of which the Christ crucified is the hub. Normally happens when you start to have to put a bit of pressure on the back wheel. You start to uh, stand up on on your pedals and you pedal up the hill and you hear this ping and you think, oh no. Because you know that that means the spoke is gone. The wheel starts doing this. There starts being tension where there shouldn't be tension. There's friction where there shouldn't be friction and the ride's a lot harder than it should be. Everything gets twisted and pulled out of proportion. It starts rubbing against the brakes or worse still, the frame of the bike and you can't go where you want to go. Things stop that should go and other things go that should stop. So this whole matter of Jesus, the Lamb of God who will baptise us with the Spirit is not just some secondary doctrine or tangent off to the side of our thinking. This is crucial for life. It's the, one of the goals of why Christ came. So as we look this morning at the theme of Jesus, Lamb and Spirit Baptizer, this is no small matter. It's a vital one. Perhaps one that we often push to the side because it's a little bit spiritual and therefore a little bit uncomfortable or a little bit unclear in our thinking. But I believe if we read the scriptures and discern what God has for us and what he has in mind as his spirit comes to us and as the spirit reveals those things to us, there's no need for fear. 
there's no need for us to be overly cautious because under the Lordship of Christ the Spirit comes and he blesses us and brings good things. One of Jesus' primary roles, as I said, was and is to baptise his disciples with the Spirit. Not just the twelve, but all believers with the Holy Spirit. So before going any further, we need to raise or just briefly clarify what it means to be baptised with the Spirit. We've probably all had different backgrounds in regards to this matter. Different experiences even. Some of us would have come from different teachings. Some of us have still got questions in our minds about what it is to be baptised with the Spirit. In one sense, it's a very normal event or experience. But in another it's not very normal at all for a sinner to be given the Spirit of God, for the Father, Son and Spirit to come and dwell in a sinful human being. It's not all that normal, is it? Yet it's exactly how God intended us to be. From dust we were created but only came to life once God breathed his life-giving Spirit into us that we might be in full communion, dwelling with God. Last week, Grant said it's a very natural, perhaps not a normal experience, but a very natural one because it's how we're made to be. Not only is it natural, it's necessary, absolutely essential if we are to live in the fullness and the dynamic of God's gift of life, of his purposes for us in life and in the ultimate glory that awaits us. And the heart and the desire of the Father is such that he gives us freely, abundantly, his spirit, the promised gift. Adam was brought to life with that life-giving breath of the spirit but since the fall we no longer know God in the same way. We're no longer energised by the spirit of God. Instead, Paul says in Ephesians 2, we now live by a different spirit the one now at work in the sons of disobedience. That's how we were before the Spirit was poured out to all believers. No longer having liberty or joy in the gospel or in the worship of God, instead a slave to sin and under the lordship of false gods, fleshly passions and fear. Friends, we need all of what Christ has done for that to be restored, that communion to be restored and for our hearts to be renewed and for all that to be brought home to us and for us to be brought home to the Father. We need the Spirit, don't we? It's not something we can work out on our own. Even Peter's declaration, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He couldn't work out on his own. It could only be revealed to him by the Father. So I'm mindful that we'll have different backgrounds, different teachings and experiences in regards to the Spirit. But when we speak of being baptised with the Spirit, I understand the Scriptures to be saying that it's not speaking of some second blessing that we're to seek after our conversion, which if we don't have, then we're lacking in some way, that we're missing out on our assurance or our faith isn't full. For in Christ, we've been given every spiritual blessing every spiritual blessing. It's not to say we won't experience times of renewal, times of refreshing or times where we know the power of God in ways that we might not otherwise. Those experiences are gifts of God. I don't want to diminish the wonder and power of those experiences, precious gifts from God. But I want to encourage all of us in this, that when you come to faith in Christ, when we receive the forgiveness of our sins, we receive the promise of the Spirit and we receive the promised Holy Spirit in full measure. We are given the full rights of sons. We are born of God and born of the Spirit. Now if you have questions or doubts about that, hear the words of Peter in Acts chapter 2 on that day of Pentecost. At the end of his... uh, his speech or his sermon at Pentecost, Acts 2 verse 38. They've just heard that this Jesus whom they crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. 
and they respond, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter says to them, repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. With their repentance and their baptism, in receiving the forgiveness of sins, they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And then Paul in 1 Corinthians, we'll read more from our Corinthians later on in this series on the Spirit, but in chapter 12, before he starts speaking of the gifts, he says, Concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Can you say Jesus is Lord? Not just verbalise it, but is it the cry of your heart? Is it what you know him to be? then you have the Spirit in full measure. So this morning, instead of being overly concerned or fearful about spiritual things, I want us to know that we need the Spirit in a very real and practical and tangible way. Most of us would be able to testify very much that we need Jesus, we need Christ, the Son of God come in flesh, his atonement, the work on the cross, the resurrection and the ascension and we could give good reason if someone asked us why we need all that. But do we have the same regard for the spirit? How would it be if there was no spirit? Just think about that for a moment. No outpouring of the spirit, no gift of the spirit. Well, there would be no gospel. There would be no church. There would be no faith. There would be no scriptures. And what about personally? If there was no spirit, if you hadn't received the spirit, then you wouldn't know the words and the truth of Jesus that he comes and brings to our minds. We'd have no understanding of the scriptures, no assurance of salvation, no assurance of the inheritance that awaits us. We wouldn't come to faith in the first place if it wasn't for the spirit. There'd be no new birth and the fruit of the spirit would not be evident in our lives. In fact, we wouldn't have life. We would just exist. For many of us, perhaps with evangelical or some might say conservative church background or upbringing, we tend to shy away from things too spiritual. Some caution and discernment is necessary. The scriptures tell us that clearly. John tells us we must test the spirits to see if they're from God but he gives one check and that is if the spirit testifies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is the son of God then it's the spirit of truth if not then it's the spirit of falsehood I remember back in my days at uni uh, we were about to go on mid-year conference AFES mid-year conference and it was around the time um, Toronto Blessing was all happening in the States and some of it over here in Australia And there were questions galore amongst all the Christians at uni. Is this from God? What's going on? And at the beginning of the conference, which just happened to be on the spirit, instead of answering all those questions, the leader said, well, let's actually go through this week and we're going to read through the scriptures and we're going to look up every passage regarding the spirit. Because the spirit testifies the same as what the son testifies, the same as what the word testifies. And by the end of that week, our questions were answered, not by the leader, but by what God had shown us through his scriptures. And we could discern, because we'd read his word, was the spirit the one who testified that Jesus Christ is the son of God? Then it's the spirit of truth, if not a spirit of falsehood. So we are to show discernment and perhaps caution but at the same time we are not to quench the fire of the Spirit. 
We are not to put out the Spirit's fire. And I think it would be fair to say that in church history and perhaps even in our own lives and experiences, out of caution and maybe even fear, we've snuffed out the flame of the Spirit. Perhaps afraid that things might get a little out of control, out of our control, maybe even a little uncomfortable given our orthodox and evangelical trans- tra- traditions. We like things to be very structured, don't we? It's not to say the Spirit is not a spirit of order. He is. But I thank God the apostles didn't snuff out the flames of the Spirit on that day of Pentecost. Uncomfortable for them, for those around them? Absolutely. Out of the ordinary? Yeah. Out of control? Maybe out of human control. But definitely foretold and controlled by God himself. Jesus himself said, wait in Jerusalem and you will receive power on high, from on high. All of it happening under the sovereign lordship of the risen Lord. And that's the testing that needs to take place with the Spirit. Is it under the lordship of the risen Christ? Does it testify to his work and his reign? Because the Spirit goes nowhere. The Spirit does nothing apart from the Son, apart from the Word, apart from Jesus. I don't know if you've ever tried speaking without using breath. Before you embarrass yourself and try it, let me tell you, you can't do it. Our words rely upon our breath. A very physical thing. So it is with the Word and the Spirit of God. The Word of God. No power without the Spirit. The Spirit, no substance without the Word. So we need the Word, we need the Son of God, Christ himself and we need the Spirit to bring to our hearts and minds all the things that he has done and to bring him to our hearts personally. Because for God, and this might sound a little heretical to begin with but hear me through, think it through, but for God to have our sins dealt with and forgiven is not enough. For his son to die, for the Lamb of God to be sacrificed once for all, to take away the sin of the world, that is not the goal of God's love and intention for us. It's a step, a vital one, a crucial one, but a step nonetheless. Because the goal of Jesus coming, the Lamb of God, is not only that our sins might be taken away, but that the Spirit might be poured out upon all nations that they might know their sins are taken away. that the promised blessing to Abraham would be fulfilled and that the earth would be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. The Father doesn't just want your sins dealt with, forgiven and remembered no more. The Father longs to have you in his family, to commune with you and you with him, that he might call you his child and call us him, for us to call him Father, Abba, Father. He wants a family. Not just any family, but one who he calls his own. One who participates in the fullness of the glory of his Son in full communion with him and serving with him and serving him in his eternal purposes for creation. And all of that can only take place when we've received the Spirit. So having our sins forgiven, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Never stop the gospel on your sins are forgiven. You'll end up with that wheel with a broken spoke. Your sins are forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now both Jesus and John make it clear that the Spirit can only come when the Son is glorified when the Lamb of God has taken away the sin of the world, he actually takes it upon himself and became sin for us. For him to be glorified was for him to go to the cross. John makes it very clear. But just flick back to John 1, the reading that we uh, heard from, from Alicia. In John 1, I don't think it's any coincidence 
that John announcing, his announcement of Jesus as the one who will baptise with the Holy Spirit is actually bookended by his declaration that Jesus is the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sin of the world. Verse 29, John sees Jesus coming towards him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then he testifies to who this one is, the one they do not know, the one with, to whom he's not even worthy to untie the sandals of. And then he says, he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. In verse 34, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptises with the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 36, he sees Jesus the next day. And there's that declaration again, behold, the Lamb of God. It's no coincidence that that declaration bookends the fact that Jesus will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. Now there's plenty of discussion amongst the commentators as what lamb did John actually mean when he said, behold, the Lamb of God? What was he referring to? Because the Jews of the day would have had numerous understandings of what a lamb was. Was it the Passover lamb? Was it the daily offerings, daily sacrifice given? Was it the annual sacrifice, the Day of Atonement, who bore the sins of Israel or for the, for the high priest and his family and then all Israel? But whichever lamb it's referring to, that John was referring to, I think John maybe didn't even understand the fullness of what he was saying that day. But whichever lamb he was referring to, it implies a sacrifice. It implied a substitution and a bearing of sins and an averting of God's wrath. But whatever John was referring to, or whatever the Spirit was referring to through John, the heart of the matter was this, that all the lambs of the past, whatever their context, whatever the sacrifice, whatever the worship of Israel, all those lambs were representative of this lamb of Jesus, the Lamb of God. All the lambs of the past were there provided by God to indicate his grace and mercy and his forgiveness but none of the lambs of the past could actually take away sin. None of the lambs of the past could actually cleanse the conscience of a believer. But this lamb, Jesus, behold the Lamb of God, he is no representative lamb, he is the lamb, not just an indicator of what's to come, but he's the substance of which everything else was a shadow, pointing towards. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works, that we might serve the living God? How much more will the blood of this lamb cleanse your conscience from acts that lead to death? And in the same way, John's baptism and all baptism before that was a baptism for repentance, for the forgiveness of sins, all with a view of something else to come or someone else to come, the Messiah. It was a baptism that symbolised something greater. John said himself, I baptise you with water, outward washing representing inward cleansing. But this one, this Lamb of God will come and he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit inward washing and real, effective and actual inward cleansing, a new heart and a new spirit within you. This Lamb of God <clears throat> will do and has done and continues to do what everything else up till that time represented. So Jesus in John's Gospel John has his own uh, Pentecost in one sense in his Gospel. When Jesus has been raised from the dead, having been crucified, glorified, he breathes on his disciples in John 20. He breathes on them. Remind you of something? Genesis, creation, new creation. Jesus breathes on his disciples and says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And he sends them out with power, to do what? To proclaim the gospel. To testify to Christ in all his work. And so we today, 
having believed on Christ. Receive the forgiveness of sins and together with the forgiveness of sins receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that Spirit, the Spirit testifies with our spirit. What does he testify to? Well, he brings to our heart and our mind all the things of Christ. He testifies to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who takes away your sin. When the Spirit comes to you, it's no longer just a theological statement, Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus the Lamb of God who has taken my sin, that I might call the Father my Father, Abba Father. And he brings us into his family, receiving the spirit of adoption, as Paul calls him. We cry, Abba, Father, and the Spirit cries, Abba, Father. So we've got one cry together with the Spirit. And we have the mind of Christ. We'll hear about that later on, another, another message. But together with the Spirit, we've been given the mind of Christ. What was Christ's mind other than to do everything and to know the Father, everything the Father desired him to do? That's the mind we've been given. And we know by the Spirit's testimony that we're children of God, heirs with Christ and will one day be glorified with Christ. I just want to say, if that's you, if you know and have received all of that and you haven't been baptised in water, Then together with Peter in Acts 10 he says, can anyone withhold water for baptising these people who have received the Holy Spirit? Just as we have. If that's you, speak to one of us, pastors or elders. Not because there's something more to be received but because that's what the Lord has commanded us to do. And that in our obedience all the more of what we've received, the gifts and the blessings become plain to us. But on the other hand, having said all I've said so far, there will be some here, no doubt, who actually question whether or not they have the fullness of the Spirit. You may look at others and say, they're always Spirit-filled. They seem to be aware of the Spirit all the time and I'm not like that, so I can't have the Spirit in the same measure. Different people have different gifts given to them. Don't covet the gifts because God's given them to, given the gifts for the building of the church. But if you've been given gifts, and we all have, then use them. Don't covet that of others. But they're not there for magical hoo-ha or one-upmanship or for show ponies. They're, the gifts are given for the building up of God's church, Christ's church. But if there's those of us here who feel we don't have the spirit or don't have very much of him, which is actually a, you can't have it that way, It's like being sort of pregnant. (laughs) Just ask a couple of our mums at the moment. You can't be sort of pregnant. But let me encourage you with the words I said back in Ephesians, from Ephesians, is we have been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans, but we will come and dwell with you. We are not left to our own devices. He's poured out his spirit upon those who believe. We may not always feel like it but friends we lack nothing because God has withheld nothing when it comes to his spirit. Unless of course we're failing to live in and walk by the spirit and we're looking to receive the things of the spirit but looking to works of the flesh to get them. Then we'll be missing out. Not because God hasn't poured out his spirit but because we're looking for things of God in things of the world. No wonder we feel like we don't have the fullness of the Spirit. And so often at that point we'll shake our fist at God for not giving what he's promised us. But all the time he's dwelling within us. A bit like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. Travelled far and wide after being thrown from Kansas to the land of Oz. She wanted to find out how to get back home, didn't she? Off she went to see the wizard along the yellow brick road picking up some interesting characters as friends along the way. Finally gets to the wizard and only finds out he's a fake. And then eventually at the end, one of the nice witches says, you've had the power all along. 
All you had to do was tap those, the heels of those shoes three times and you'd be there. We have the Spirit. Perhaps a biblical illustration is better. <laughs> trying to involve all areas of the congregation here. The Gospel according to Oz? I don't know. The things they teach at Bible college, eh? <laughs> a biblical illustration. What about the brother of the prodigal son? Prodigal son comes home, father throws a party, welcomes him back into the family with the full rights of being a son again. But his brother, the one who's been slaving away for years, stands outside resentful, angry, stubborn, shaking his fist at his father and says, you never gave me anything. To which the father says, my son, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. You have it. You're trying to slave away to get what you've already been given as a gift because you are mine and I am yours and you are with me and I am with you. Take whichever illustration you want. Everything I have is yours. You have the Spirit. And my third point, which I've mentioned a little bit along the way but have left little time for, was that having received the Spirit, we receive power from on high, but for a particular purpose. As we receive the Spirit, he's the same Spirit and the same power that raised Christ from the dead, the same Spirit who remains on him, who in Isaiah 11 that we heard is the spirit of wisdom, of counsel, of understanding and power, of knowledge and fear of the Lord that we delight in. Well, what's the power of the Spirit? Well, the power is in what the Spirit testifies to and all that he testifies to is Christ. It's no coincidence, as I said before, that behold the Lamb of God bookends the baptism of the Spirit that Jesus brings to us. So that's the testimony of the Spirit. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's the power of the Spirit. I'm not ashamed of the Gospel, says Paul, for it's the power of God for salvation. We don't need any other power. We don't need any other wonderful words or wonderful ways. Just the way of God, the way of the Spirit. Walk in Him, not in the flesh not in the world. So just as Christ said to his disciples, receive the Spirit. Know that you've been given him in full measure and go out in the power of the Spirit, giving witness to the work of Christ in you, proclaiming his kingdom among the nations, whether that be at work or overseas or over the fence, at home, school, uni, our mission field is wherever the Spirit takes us. For one fellow, he was in one place at one time and the next minute he was running alongside a chariot, going in the power of the Spirit, revealing the wonderful works of God and Christ. And as you go, don't quench the Spirit. Don't put out his fire in your belly but go knowing that the Father and the Son and the Spirit are with you always and everything the Father has is yours. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your generous giving that you gave your Son that all who believe in him might have eternal life. And Father, that you've given your spirit through your Son that you've baptised all believers with the spirit that we might know you and call you our Father. That we might know our sins are forgiven 
not just as some doctrine or some words on a page, but that our sins are forgiven, that our hearts are cleansed, renewed, restored. Father, there may be some of us here that cry out, what must we do to be saved, to receive this spirit? And so, Father, we encourage and say to them, repent and be baptised and you will receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Spirit. And, Father, for those of us here who have felt like we're only half full or half empty, Father, just assure us that we've received every spiritual blessing in Christ and strengthen us and grant to us the wisdom that we might go on walking in the Spirit and not look to the flesh or the world or anything else, but just to know you as Father, to join in your family, in the communion with you, with Son and Spirit, and to enjoy life abundant and eternal that you've given us. Father, these things we pray through the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.